we'll start recording. Thank you. All right. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So we're going to start my presentation here. Can you see that, Rachel? Yes. That okay. Good. Great. So hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here virtually. My name is, is Cora Mousseau. I'm with the Jackson Soil and Water Conservation District. I am the community water resource conservationist. So I specialize mainly in residential water conservation, stormwater management, but there's some odds and ends thrown in there as well. So uh, thank you. We're gonna be talking about rain gardens and bioswales today. So let's get started. So just a little outline of what we're gonna talk about today. I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of the district, just in case you haven't heard of us. We're always trying to, uh, you know, share information about us in case people haven't heard. Then I will cover stormwater management just broadly and then dive into some specifics on both rain gardens and bioswales. So my talk and all is gonna be about an hour. And then the remaining 30 minutes, We'll just open it up for a Q&A. Um, as Rachel mentioned, um, at, throughout this talk, please write any questions you may have in that chat box. And then Rachel will look through and read those questions to me during that allotted time. And if for some reason, again, if there's a clarification question and it's easier just to unmute you, we can do that as well. And if any time allows, I'll review some online resources that I think would be helpful for you all. Um, but if we're not able to have time for that, that's no worries because that will be in those follow-up notes that I send to Rachel. So you'll be receiving the full presentation as well as those notes. So if I go too fast or anything like that, know that most of the information is probably gonna be in those summary notes. So no worries on that. All right. so. Who is JSWCD? So our main slogan is turning natural resource concerns into opportunities. It's really our main goal is to help mitigate those natural resource concerns for folks. Really, really briefly, we actually originated back in the 1930s. A lot of people don't know that there's roughly a district for every county in the entire country. So back in the 35, um, when the Dust Bowl era was happening, the Soil Conservation Act was signed in. That created the Soil Conservation Service, which is now NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. And a couple years later, more of a localized version was created. We're kind of called different things throughout the country, but we're called soil and water conservation districts here in Oregon. And here locally, we were established Jackson County wide in 1966. We're, we don't work for the county. It's a special district separate from the county, but it is county wide. I know that's kind of confusing. Um, and in 2006, a tax rate was passed. So for everyone who's a property owner, $1,000 of assessed value, uh, we get five cents of that. And that goes and pays for oversight and also some programs I'll chat about. So this is really giving back to you all who pay your taxes. So thank you. So this is us. This is our nine person staff. We kind of run the gamut here. So we have several conservationists. So I'm kind of more urban conservation, stormwater management. We also have agriculture conservation. We have riparian and forestry. We have an engineer who specializes in irrigation. We have an education and outreach coordinator, monitoring, and then our admin team. So we kind of cover a lot of different resource concerns. So if you ever encounter any of those types of things that I mentioned, feel free to peruse our website and look for the proper staff and give us a call. So our main driving force at the district is to provide free technical assistance. Again, it's free because we're, we're paying back the Jackson County residents for those tax dollars. And we help people in many different ways. Sometimes it's just those simple phone calls and uh, emails. Other times we go out on site visits. We kind of call them our one-off site visits. If someone has a just a specific question, we can go out, give them some tools and materials, and they can go on their way. Other times, we can help more with project planning and we can even help them with some funds. So we do have a district funds program which includes paying for rain gardens and bioswells in case anyone wants to take this information and apply it in their own yards. Um, but, and we can also help connect people to funds um, that are beyond what the district can provide. 
We also offer education and outreach programs, including classes such as this one. Um, when we are able to, again, we do tabling events. We do a day camp every summer for middle schoolers and uh, various tours and other monitoring programs. We kind of do a whole lot of things, but we do monitor water quality. So stormwater management is definitely a big priority of ours. So the things we're going to talk about, it's not just conceptual, it really is real world based things. So we fund and we kind of focus on many different types of resource concerns. The two main that we'll be discussing today is stormwater quality and then water conservation, because I definitely think these two stormwater features also help conserve water. But we have a bunch of other programs that we either can help fund or, you know, these are just kind of the, um, just some of the things that we really value. So I thought I'd put that up there. All right, let's dive in. So stormwater, we know it's rain or it's water in some form, right? That falls from the sky. And stormwater is supposed to naturally soak into the ground, right? It's supposed to naturally soak back in. It's supposed to um, replenish the aquifers and the surface waters. And that's just the cycle. Well, in our developed world, that isn't necessarily the case anymore, you know, with all this concrete and roads and homes that really impedes this natural process from happening. And so that's why we need to manage the stormwater. Just a second. My computer's thinking. Come on. I'm just going to do this for a second. It's testing with me today. There we go. All right. <laughs> so low impact development. So a lot of you have probably heard of LID. LID is really an umbrella term that is designed to mimic these natural processes in order to mitigate that stormwater. So there's many different kinds of low impact development just many different kinds, and I don't want to confuse you with a bunch of terms. Um, one common one is called green infrastructure. And again, that can be a bunch of different features. Uh, but just know that LID is, is a means to mimic um, this process. And if you search LID on DEQ's website forever, or you can, you can look on it. Oh my gosh, you could get lost on that website. There's just so many different types. Um, so there's kind of four main purposes of stormwater mitigation, but they all overlap one another. So the first thing you're wanting to do is reducing on-site erosion. Stormwater can scour sites depending on the landscaping and it can be bad news, right? But then you also have to think of those off stream or down the road, so to speak, to neighbors impacts. So you can have erosion on your site, but then it causes sedimentation. So that's a concern, not only just for in infrastructure concerns for neighbors, but you also have to think about sedimentation in waterways, it's harmful to fish, etc. You want to reduce the quantity of stormwater leaving your site. You don't want like a makeshift creek flowing off of your property, right? Um, because that can pick up a lot of chemicals along the way. That can pick up any pollutants and then it sends it downstream. So we want to mitigate that. And then we also want to improve the quality of stormwater leaving the site. Again, it's picking up all of those pollutants. So there's a lot of things that we want to do. We want to slow velocity, we want to clean the water as we go, and we want to avoid any adverse impacts as possible to surrounding neighbors and to streams and potential infrastructure. So when we're talking about pollution, I just kind of wanted to clarify, I'm, I'm mainly referring to non-point source pollution, meaning we don't really know exactly where that pollution is coming from. Sometimes point solution is known as point source, so it's like a direct pipe, for example. Cities can pipe, or they do, uh, they pipe their storm drain straight to the creek, completely unfiltered, and that would be point source because you actually know where that water source came from. You can say, oh, it's from this street. But a lot of the times when we're talking about 
pollution, we don't know the origins. And so this is one of those things where if you don't know the origins, we all have to collectively do our part to make sure that the streams are remaining clean and that we're not, you know, adversely impacting anything just by allowing stormwater to flow every which way. So there are many different types of stormwater features. I had listed four. I feel like these are pretty common ones people talk about. Um, there's also, I would say, planter boxes. I could have added that to this list as well. But the two we're going to be talking about today are rain gardens and bioswales. So let's start with rain gardens. So you've probably seen, well, you've probably seen both of these around town quite a bit. Uh, rain gardens are sunken garden beds and they primarily collect water off of uh, building roofs, um, whether it's a home, but it could also be a barn or any other outbuilding. And they are designed to divert this water, this roof water runoff into the rain garden. And then there's layers of amended material, drain rock, soil, mulch, and then plants that naturally soaks that water in. And so it's designed to temporarily store and then soak that water in. And rain gardens can look very, very different. There is no one size fits all. Some are more circular, some are kind of shaped like a kidney bean, some are more of a square. So with rain gardens, it's not so much it needs to fit a certain look, it's more it needs to fit a certain functionality. It all comes down to functionality. So they're incredibly aesthetic, right? You can plant them with beautiful flowers and grasses and such, but what defines it as a rain garden is that it's able to drain that water. So there's a couple different types of rain gardens. I'm mainly going to be talking about the more naturalized type. So infiltration, cleans, detains, reduces that stormwater, mainly just with the plants and the soil. And filtration is kind of more engineered. It has a lot more pipes and beehive rims going on. Honestly, I feel like if you need to, and this is, kind of just my opinion, but if you have to heavily engineer your soil so much in order for it to cater to a rain garden, the soil may be just a little too poor in terms of um, being able to withstand having that stormwater feature. Maybe you should just install a French drain. Um, so I'll be talking about infiltration rates and whether or not a rain garden would be appropriate. So we're mainly going to focus more on this natural type. Not only is it more aesthetic, but I think it's just more practical and more affordable than having this all of this pipe and heavy engineering. Um, maybe commercial people would want that, but for a residential scale, I don't think that would be the best route. This is wanting to freeze on me again. There we go. Just want to make sure I didn't skip anything. Okay, so here's the materials that are primarily for those more, the infiltration, the more natural types of rain gardens. And again, you'll be getting all of these slides, so don't worry about jotting all of this down. So there's rocks as the first category. So it's layer of rock, commonly three quarter inch rock, that's, that's at the most bottom part of the rain garden. And that's going to really help with that drainage. And above the rock, I'm gonna go a little out of order here, we have um, amended soil. And I'll talk about soil amendments, but um, you wanna make sure that the soil is going to be able to permeate that water filter, um, but also hold on a little. You don't, you don't want it to filter too much and then the plants aren't getting any water. So we have rocks, we have amended soil, and then compost, and then we have mulch, and then we have plants. So that's kind of more of the actual uh, materials within the rain garden. And then in terms of surrounding the rain garden, there are pipes involved. And so firstly, you need downspouts sometimes especially like older buildings like barns don't. So if you ever want to install a rain garden near a building, first of all, you want to make sure you have downspouts. And then you have downspout connector slash diverter where you divert that water out into the rain garden. And it's like, just like an elbow for PVC pipe. And um, 
then you have to think about and so that's the outflow and then you have to think about the overflow design so there is an overflow design that needs to be built into the rain garden structure and otherwise if it fills up think about it's just like a bowl um, if it fills up during a heavy storm event, you want to be able to control that overflow. Other, otherwise, it's just going to disperse out and um, it could potentially wash back and maybe damage your foundation, right? You don't want that to happen. So um, overflow for rain gardens can either be a pipe, um, wh whether it's more like a French drain or whether it's completely closed and that could be diverted to an existing stormwater system or um, perhaps a ditch if the water is already naturally flowing that way anyways. Um, or it could flow into a bioswale and then we'll talk about bioswale. So these really do overlap. Um, you could have some rock and riprap. We, it just needs to go somewhere. And then the, the final feature of the rain garden is the surrounding berm. Um, should be a few inches high where it basically will help hold that water in. It's just made from soil. Um, so in, it has a little lip. So instead of it just being not enclosed, that water, it's, it's another safety net. So the water just doesn't flow everywhere. So those are all the materials for rain gardens. A huge safety consideration, and this goes for any project, make sure to call before you dig, any excavation work. You wanna make sure that you are not hitting any utility lines, that's, that's a big one. You also don't want to install a rain garden too close to infrastructure. So I believe this is on other um, slides, but there's various recommendations, but basically you don't want it, you know, within 10 feet of your foundation, three feet of a sidewalk. And um, I, I've seen five to 10 feet from a property line or fence line. You don't want it too close to infrastructure, again, because in case it overflows, you don't want to just be diverting that water, sending it in a large amount to infrastructure and you could potentially damage the infrastructure. So just kind of a, a note with that, we always wanna make sure we're staying safe. So there's seven main installation type uh, steps for rain gardens. So we're going to review those. So the first thing, and this goes for any, um, any feature really or any project you want to do on your site is to create a site map and you want it to scale so i'd recommend on graph paper and if you don't know the direct dimensions of your home i'd recommend grabbing a partner or a socially distanced nowadays friend and doing some measurements outside around your home and um kind of things particularly within the context of stormwater that you want to note is first of all what are just the existing features that you need to work around and then this will help determine your location so what's the footprint of the home what's the footprint of the garage any other sheds or outbuildings that you have driveway sidewalks existing trees and uh, you know ac boxes anything like that and then once you have those then you want to make sure that you mark all of your downspouts because that's actually where you're going to be diverting water from regardless of what stormwater feature you're installing and then after you mark your downspouts you want to mark any sloped areas or if there's low spots maybe where water is naturally draining to anyways and so this really paints a picture of your property and after you do that uh, i would recommend when it rains to step outside and see where that water's going so you know put on a hood and go and walk around and see what your downspouts are doing see if there's water that kind of seems to be pooling around your foundation is there water that's ever pooling around your yard and uh, especially maybe after you watered, maybe that could also be a testament to just overwatering, and then that's a whole other class, really. Um, but you really want to see how your site is functioning because then you want to you want the projects to cater to your site and to be useful and practical and helpful. So that's really the first step is just what are you working with, and deciding which impervious surface to use again commonly that roof and you also want to determine the surface area and we'll talk about that in a second so determining the location of the rain garden 
So the easiest location is several feet out or, you know, just accessible from a rain or from a rain gutter or downspout. It also needs to be downslope because all of this is going to be gravity fed. You don't want it upslope randomly. You know, rain gardens aren't on a pumped design. It's not that fancy. So that kind of will help situate you. So if you have, you know, a lower spot in your yard, that's where the rain garden should be and the soil should be dug out and leveled. Uh, but you don't want it on too steep of a slope. You don't want it steeper than 10% because it could easily overflow and, you know, not retain that water, which will then kind of create a pointless system, right? If it's not fulfilling those original goals. You also kind of where not to put it, it's kind of the easiest part to locate where to put it is to um, rule out where not to put it. So if you have septic drain fields far, far away from that, you do not want to mess with that. And if your property is really close to the groundwater table, it also wouldn't be really e efficient because you're just digging and it's constantly water and the entire purpose is it's draining. So you wouldn't want that, you know, you don't want to create a pond or anything like that. You don't want standing water. You don't want standing water in a rain garden for more than a day, honestly. It, it should be able to filter in. And you also don't want to put a rain garden in soils with really, really poor drainage. So if soils drain less than a half of an inch per hour, it probably just is, isn't suitable and you probably need something more engineered like pipes. Or contaminated soil, so commercial companies installing rain gardens in old brown fields, really not ideal because again, the purpose of the rain gardens are to allow that water to filter down into the groundwater table. And so if you're purposely kind of transporting contaminated water, probably not the best thing. Um, so before you can amend your soil, you need to know what soil you're working with. And there's many different types. And I'm kind of going to breeze through these, but again, all of this you'll have access to. So there's the field test, you wet it, does it make a ball? If so, it probably has quite a bit of clay. If it just completely is gritty and doesn't do anything, probably a lot of sand. And if it's somewhere in between, you probably have quite a bit of silt. There's also the ribbon test, pretty similar to the ball with clay, it just should roll into a ribbon if it's clay heavy. And then pretty much the same for um, the other soils. There's the mason jar test. I actually learned this one um, in land stewards a couple years ago or three years ago now. And um, so this is you fill a mason jar about halfway with soil and then you fill it with water, you shake it up and then you let it settle overnight. And then it'll actually divide into the three soil layers and then you can calculate the rough percentages of sand, silt and clay. So that's a pretty nifty one. There's also the infiltration test. I feel like this one's a bit more accurate to get that infiltration rate, the inches per hour. So you dig a hole in your yard about one foot deep and make sure to, to measure that so it's accurate. You fill it a couple times with water and then drain. And then you pour water in it a third time. And then you time the amount um, or the amount of time that it takes um, to drain in an hour or the, the amount of inches it takes to drain. So um, if it's less than a half of an inch down by the time an hour is up, probably not the best for a rain garden. There's also an online resource that I, I will um, go through if we have time. It's called the Web Soil Survey. It can also show you your native soils. So step three, um, still on step three, assessing the soil. So this is straight out of the Oregon Rain Garden Guide. I also have this listed in the notes. You can also find it. It's linked in our website. This is kind of the go-to guide. I use this to help plan all of my rain garden projects. And so this shows the drainage rate, again, even with this guide, less than a half of an inch per hour, really not recommended for a rain garden. And then it shows kind of the different other features or filtration changes as you get faster and faster rates. Okay, so ways to amend your soil. So now that you know the soil that you're working with, then you can amend it. The goal really is to create more like a sandy loam in general landscaping, I'd say loam, but for a rain garden, you need a little faster permeability. 
And so you can do this in many ways. Again, it just kind of depends on the soil that you're working with. Commonly, we're dealing with pesky clays here in this area, unless you're living in Ashland, for example, and then you're dealing with the fun DG. Um, but with clays, compost can be really great in filtration. You can even add some sand to kind of break up that clay um, to, to speed up that, you know, infiltration ability, but many different types of soil amendments, but I definitely wanted to throw that in there because if soils aren't amended properly in a rain garden, then it's not going to function properly. So determining the size of the rain garden um, is actually quite simple. So, and this, this um, is actually a little fact sheet we have um, on our website as well. And this is to determine the smallest amount that your rain garden should be. So you can always size it up, but the goal is to not have it too small because if it's too small, then it's not able to filter that water in quick enough and then that could cause some overflowing. So it's always bigger is, is always better in terms of designing the rain garden. So first all you have to do is calculate the, I'm going to switch, there we go. All you have to do is calculate the area of the impervious surface. So it's commonly the roof. So if you have a pretty standard roof and it's pretty uniform, roughly the roof area is going to be the same as the area of the home, um, as long as it's not two story, but, um, but in terms of the dimensions. So, you know, width times length, you get that area. Now, if you're dealing with well-drained soils, so this relates to having to calculate that infiltration rate, if your soils are draining pretty well, then the rain garden only needs to be 10% of that roof size. So in this example, they had a 1300 square foot roof and they had good soils, so the rain garden needed to be at least 130 square feet. But that kind of helps set the scope and then the cost of plants and everything like that, right? The size really matters in terms of the, the feasibility of the project. Well, in poor drain soils, you actually need to essentially multiply that 130 by two, okay? Because you need more room for poor soils to be able to filter water since it takes some more time. So you multiply the 1300 by 0.2 to get 260 square feet. So Pretty simple calculation. That's the starting point. Again, you can always scale them up, but you don't want it any less than that. Um, yeah, so that's how you calculate the size. So the garden depth. So ponding depth is another thing. So we have the rain garden size, but we also need to care about how deep it is. So again, the, the deeper the rain garden, it's able to hold more water. And that's essentially the ponding depth, the depth that it can be before it spills over. And um, the ponding depth, depending on the infiltration rate or the drainage rate, kind of interchangeable there, it, it'll span from six to 24 inches. So uh, I also have this little table in the notes, but um, depending on that rate, um, the, the slower the rate, the deeper it needs to be. Similar to the size, right? The slower the rate, the larger it needs to be. So just keep that in mind. You don't want it too shallow and then water just overflows. So I know this is a lot of, a lot of words, but there's, there's quite a bit of information. I essentially was trying to boil down all seven steps that were listed in this manual. So once you know where to place your rain garden, you need to determine your overflow. And you need to determine your overflow before you dig, as well as irrigation plans, right? That's planning is the most important step. So once you know where the rain garden goes, or maybe the overflow can also help you, you in deciding where it's located, um, you need to see where you're going to divert that overflow. So maybe you are in a um, common residential neighborhood, you have a storm drain right there, water is already naturally flowing off your site, so you know you're not adding to it and you know that the water that is going into the storm drain is actually filtered now, um, then you can let that overflow into the street essentially because the storm drains right there. Um, 
if you are near a ditch, you can do that. Um, I'll mention in a little bit ordinances, um, depending on how you have your plumbing or piping set up, it could potentially trigger a plumbing permit and that is so situational. I don't really want to say this would and this wouldn't, um, but just be aware of that in the back of your mind that um, if there was any feature in a rain garden that would trigger an ordinance, it would be the piping to just make sure you're not adding to a stormwater system if it's not allowed. I just always want to make sure state that. Um, so that's for the overflow. Uh, an or overflow can also be a bioswale or could even maybe be another rain garden. Um, that's an option too. So there's lots of different options for overflows. Um, also with irrigation, you want to make sure that um, and I'll, I'll talk about this with plants, but just in terms of things to think about before you actually break ground. Um, you want to think about a water source because although the plants um, ideally will be receiving that, you know, uh, rainwater during dry months, they're not going to get that. And so they need to be established. And so you either need to water them with your municipal water or, you know, have some drip going, something like that. So if people don't have access to a great water source, that can also make or break a planting project. So just something to think about before you excavate. Okay, so now that you've have thought about those things, with um, excavation, grading, berms, and soil. So that's really the, the first step is you have to excavate first. Depending on the scale, I mean, it can, it can involve machinery, but I've also heard of people creating rain gardens just with shovels. It's a lot of work, but it's possible. It just kind of ties into your budget and your ability and the size of the rain garden and how nice your soils are to you. Um, but so when I say excavation, it could also be just a soil in the ground. Again, after you dial 811, of course. And it's important to regrade the soils a little bit or rake back just to avoid any compaction. Uh, berms, again, that, that essentially the lip around the rain garden. And the berms should be at least two inches in height to allow that kind of safety feature. And um, there's also tilling recommendations to really help break up the soil, but again, it depends on the soil you're working with, um, but that uh, can be a tool in the toolbox for amending. And then the plumbing features for installation. So I'd say probably in terms of stepwise, it would first be the excavation, and then probably I would install the plumbing pretty close to after that, because you wanna make sure that the pipe is going to the proper place in the lowest spot of the rain garden before you add any of the other amended materials. So for plumbing, um, so again, we have our overflow and putting riprap around the pipes for the inflow and overflow is great because if it's a really heavy storm event, you don't want to be causing erosion throughout the rain garden. And um, it's important to grade the pipe depending on how far out the rain garden is from the property. It should at least be 10 feet again, but you know, if it's further out, you want that pipe to drop about one inch every 10 feet. Again, this is gravity fed. And um, the plumbing code requires uh, you to bury that foot about a foot down. So those are just the type of installation components. But again, the rain garden guide has all of the construction stuff. So that was a very, <laughs> very boiled down version. So step six is choosing the right plant for the right place. So first of all, you want to make sure that you are choosing plants ideally that are native, right? But then also that can thrive without any chemical inputs. You really don't want to be adding fertilizers or, you know, pesticides for weeds or anything like that because this is a stormwater feature and because again you're directing it to the groundwater and with the overflow it's eventually going to surface waters you don't want to be purposely inputting any more chemicals right that the purpose is to be filtering the chemicals so make sure that they're pretty hardy plants that can do well just kind of as is and really the goal for these plants is that they need to be water tolerant in a sense that during the stormwater event, they can take a lot of water for, you know, several months out of the year. But then also during the summer months, these plants need to be able to dry out 
and receive little to no water, you know, maybe some supplemental water when it's really hot, but on most days, they should just be good. So these plants, you know, not every plant is good in a rain garden. It's, you know, kind of ties into that hardiness zone. Um, so that's really the, the goal of plants. They need to be great with water, but also great without. And um, there's three main zones of plants and there's various plants for each zone. I have some listed in here, but we also have some on our website, which I hi highly recommend you look those up. And maybe I can also um, send those to Rachel as well to, to um, send out to you all because those have pictures associated. So you can see the color scheme and size and everything like that. But there's three main zones for the rain garden. There's gonna be your base or the wet or the moist zone. And this is the zone that if it's raining, it's there's likely it's going to be wet if not standing water for a little bit so these plants need to be really really tolerant of those conditions and then there's the slope or the intermediate so that is plants that can prefer moist or dry conditions and then the dry zone or the top zone are plants that are pretty much dry all the time but during high rain events they can get a little wet so it's important to plant in the respective zones so you're not drowning out plants or um, parching. I, I was trying to think of the, the word, but you know, you don't you don't want uh, to inadvertently kill your plants if you plant them in the wrong zone. So here's a schematic of those three zones. And so it just depends on um, where it's located in the rain garden. So the plant placement is really important. You can't just dig a hole and throw any plants in there. It really is, is um, there, there's a method to the madness of this. So here's just some plants that are great in the base. Again, don't worry about writing these down. You'll get all of these. And there's also even more in those plant lists. Um, there are some trees, depending on the scale of the rain garden, they're not as common. Commonly, it's more shrubs and flowering shrubs and grasses, but they do exist. So a bunch of different types of plants there for that base. For the slope, there's even more. So there's some really, you know, pretty plants out there that can work with this. And a lot of these plants you um, will commonly see in riparian areas as well, not so surprisingly because they're water loving. And then there's that upper edge zone and, and a lot of these overlap so you'll see some repeats in there. Some can thrive in all three zones, it just really depends on the plant and their root structure. Um, so like I mentioned, you can design your rain garden in many different ways. There's really no one size fits all in terms of the look of a rain garden, so it really comes down to your aesthetics and the size of your yard and the layout of your yard. So here's a couple examples from the back of that Oregon rainwater guide um, specific to Southwest Oregon. So these are some nice example sketches and you can see very, you know, two very different design with different plants, but they're both very pretty and um, really fulfill that functionality. And then step seven, last but not least, maintenance is very important. And this goes for any landscaping feature, but for rain gardens as well, you wanna make sure that you're hand weeding the rain, rain garden so those natives can establish and get those strong root systems. Prune those plants as needed. I would definitely recommend planting uh, perennials, right? Because the end goal is to not have to constantly, you know, be upkeeping the plants and so, if you're planting annuals every year, that's really not going to fulfill the, um, the overall goal. Um, and also they're never going to be quite established if they're just constantly dying out. So you can add some annuals for fillers, sure, but I would definitely recommend your main plants be perennials. Um, add some more mulch as needed and make sure to water those plants until established. Um, either on automatic timers if you're able to, like drip irrigation is really great, or if you're always home and your rain garden is pretty small, you could hand water too, but just make sure that water is, is happening, watering is happening. All right, I'm gonna take a quick drink of water and then we're going to go into bioswales. Now there wasn't 
as many definitive vial swale guides. So there's still a lot of information, but I'm not gonna have like those perfect steps like I did for rain gardens. So bile swales, I'll talk about bile swales and then I'll compare them to rain gardens in a sec. So bile swales are defined as linear vegetated channeled depressions. Now these swales can be dry or wet. So dry meaning primarily they have just rock and then wet meaning they're more vegetated. And they are really great for natural drainage. So a lot of times swales are great to be installed with the natural contours. And bioswales can be used, honestly, in any land use type. You can scale them up or scale them down. Um, so you can have them in your home. You see them a lot in commercial areas. They're really common in parking lots. They're really great there. You can also even have them in large ag systems. So there's not like a certain size per se that a bioswale needs to be. Again, it comes down to more of the functionality. And Bioswales are really supposed to, or the purpose is that they transport water and while they're transporting that water, they're naturally filtering it and slowing the velocity. And that's the main difference between bioswales and rain gardens. Bioswales transport water from point A to point B. Essentially, they're like a replacement to a pipe. They're, it's it's a, an ability to move water from one area to another. So a lot of times you'll see a swale and then it goes into a storm drain. You'll see that a lot in those parking lot setups. And um, so they, they filter water with the plants and soil, and then they slow the water. So they're slowing that velocity, which decreases erosion concerns and, and pollutants because they're slowing the velocity uh, with rock, right? Riprap and rock can help break up um, the, the water flow. And um, so as rain gardens are meant to naturally or you know capture temporarily store and filter on site bioswales transport and filter so similar but they are different and um swales can be designed to, again to fit into that landscape to fit into the to the contour they're really not great against a contour i guess it depends on the situation but um again you want them situated in a way that where they're going to be transporting that water properly. So here's a couple examples. Uh, here's a dry swale versus a wet swale. Wet swale, has, it kind of looks more like a rain garden where there's standing water, but then it's eventually going into those drain pipes. And a dry swale, although there is vegetation, it's a lot more rocky. So just comes down to aesthetic, but then also needs. So here's an example from a project in Ashland um, several years back. And this is an example of a side yard conversion bioswale. Now this specific project, there, it was actually for something else and she just had some extra funds. And so she installed this and it was great. Um, if this was you know, the main focus of the project, I probably would have asked about buffer, you know, in terms of closeness to the house and the fence line, just a little too close. Um, but I wanted to show you that because it's a great example in terms of aesthetics. But if, um, if she was experiencing heavy pooling or drainage in this yard, it might not have been the best to have a swale right there just because it's so close. But in terms of, a, of aesthetics and if there happened to be any extra irrigation, you can see right here, the downspout's right there. So it's gonna be piping water into it. Um, that was fully functional. So those are kind of the things I like and don't like about this design. So wanted to mention both. So sizing a bioswale, again, really depends on the volume of water it will receive. It depends on the size of the site. Um, so, Again, just really, really depends. Um, the flow depth in terms of the, the actual depth of the swale shouldn't exceed more than uh, six inches. Water can't be as well treated because you're not amending the soils underneath there. So you don't want the bioswale too deep because you don't want water to be captured for too long, right? It's supposed to be transporting. So they should definitely be shallower than a rain garden would be. And then the bioswale is at least six inches deeper than the flow depth, 
because you have water on top and then the bottom part of the swale underneath, you wanna make sure that there's a little bit of buffer so the water can go over the top. And um, in some resources I was looking at, they mentioned a nine minute minimum uh, retention time. So maybe a, I, I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm clear and you know the swale shouldn't be like rushing water all the time. It's kind of like a trickle and it filters the water and transports it. So you're not creating like a rushing stream. Um, it should be allowed some time to, to filter. And swales are best suited for slopes under 5%. If, if they're any steeper, it's just going to cause an erosion issue and causing too much water to go wherever you're diverting it to. And that's what we're trying to avoid with stormwater mitigation. So the materials are pretty similar to rain garden. They're just a little simpler. So you have your drain rock and some riprap to mitigate that velocity. Commonly it's PVC piping for overflows and outflows, depending on where you're diverting the water from. Could also be um, your rain gutters. Plants, again, all those different plant lists. Soil amendments, similar concepts as rain garden. And then mulch is recommended about two and a half inches thick for that um, water retention for the plants and making sure that it doesn't get too weedy. So again, important to, I feel like it's a lot, of, there, this is where, where we're encountering a lot of overlaps with rain gardens. It's important to test those natives to make sure that you have um, your infiltration rate. And for swales, the ideal infiltration rate is between a half an inch and 12 inches. If it's under, they're pr it's probably just not gonna function as well. And if it's over, it's gonna flow way too fast that it kind of defeats the whole purpose or it's just not needed anyways, right? If your infiltration rate is above 12 inches, you don't need a swale. And the ideal mixture of swale is about 60% sandy loam and 40% compost. So that's kind of the goal to get to in your soil amendments for ample filtration and um, permeability. So plants, ideally, you know, you want plants that can reduce slow stormwater runoff. And so you want them kind of that, that are deeper roots in order to hold that water in and uh, strengthen the system. You also want them, this is about four to five inches tall in their you know, developed um, size. You don't want them too small because again, they're likely not gonna have that strong of roots. So they're not gonna be really that great with erosion prevention. Again, you also don't want to include any chemicals with these. So they need to be pretty hardy in terms of their survivability. They need to be drought tolerant and when they dry out in the summer, just like rain gardens would. And native plants are preferred and of course, you know, pollinator loving habitats, increasing plants are always preferred as they fulfill even more needs than just stormwater maintenance. I always recommend planting as many pollinator plants as you possibly can in your yard. And so here's some of the plant lists for bioswales and they have kind of a wet zone, an intermediate and a dry zone too. It's just a little shallower, but you know, there's immediately in the channel, if you will, and then it kind of goes out from there. So similar concept as a rain garden. Checking my time here, okay. And um, so here, again, different types of plants for bioswales, many different kinds, but I know that's a lot of plants. Um, and then the dry, and these are all in the plant list that you'll get. And um, bioswales have actually been proven to be pretty successful at pollutant removal. There's been studies done that they can help remove uh, phosphorus uh, 20 to 40% and nitrogen 25 to 35%. This is really amazing because nitrogen and phosphorus are some, you know, th those harmful um, pollutants that can really cause issues, particularly in aquatic species. They can cause anaerobic, anaerobic conditions for fish and it's called eutrophication, if you've heard of that, um, can kill fish. So making sure that, you know, we're filtering water that is on our site and it's cleaner when it leaves our site, I think is really amazing. And um, so there's grassy swales. So for example, if you just had, you know, fescues or bromes, 
those are great and those are uh, you know a type of swale but with this whole pollutant removal those deep rooted plants more um, vegetation shrubs uh, appear to be better at filtering just because I'm just kind of logically connecting the dots they have deeper roots so they can filter the water more with deeper roots so just think about that and where you're planning wherever on your on your property if you want pollutants to be removed prior to exiting the site the deeper the plant the more likely that will be a possibility shallower grasses might not be the best with that but it's better than nothing so constructing with a swale, and honestly, this goes for rain gardens too, you wanna to try and avoid compaction as much as possible. So if you are using equipment, if it's more of an excavation, like an actual excavator, um, it'd be great if they can rake back to kind of minimize that disturbance so it's not just like compact, right? Because it's kind of ironic if you're trying to do a stormwater feature and um, you know, particularly like in um, commercial sites, they wanna install stormwater features and yet they're going over the site back and forth with um, equipment and tires and that's really going to compact the soil and completely defeat the purpose of what they're wanting. So just being mindful of that and um, even with foot traffic raking back because your feet and shoes can also compact that soil down. Just a little helpful tip there. Similar to uh, rain gardens, it's important for swales to be 10 feet away from a foundation. You don't want any backflow or, you know, um, drainage problems around the foundation or be diverting water to the foundation. So 10 feet away from that and then five feet away from property lines to make sure you're not diverting water to your neighbor. Here's an example of a bioswale cross section. I know that, um, I believe that OSU also has many of these as well. You could probably peruse on their website. Um, but um, yeah, there, so there's the various uh, grades and mulch and, um, and then plants. So it's a more simple design than, um, than rain gardens, I'd say. And then maintenance. So again, maintenance is incredibly important. You wanna make sure that the functionality is still working well. Um, inspecting the swales about every three months, just make sure that there's no clogs. Swales can clog up a little more because they're a little more shallow and because they're really transporting that water. So if you have any sediment buildup, clear that out. Reseeding and revegetating as needed if there's any die off because you want to make sure that there's that deep rooted plants. If your plants die, you need to replant them. Managing any pests naturally making sure to avoid those chemicals. Um, if you do have grass, you know, mow them if they get out of hand, just kind of the typical management of landscaping at that point. Um, also with irrigation, you wanna make sure that you don't over irrigate once the plants are established. You don't wanna be irrigating still and then it rains and then the swale just overflows automatically because it's already taken in water. So you wanna make sure once the plants are established, you kind of just let it be. And then legality, just want to mention this as like a, as like a disclaimer. Um, compared to other stormwater features, I definitely don't think biocells or rain gardens would trigger as much permitting or anything like that. But again, depending on how the plumbing is set up, I would just recommend contacting your municipality, just making sure that you're not inadvertently you know, violating anything like that. You just don't want to have to deal with that. So it's better just to know that ahead of time. And um, also dialing 811, call before you dig. Just want to put that out there again. Okay, so now we are at our Q&A period. We have about 30 minutes left. Um, so I will exit out of my shared screen, but if you guys have questions on the slides, I can go back in if you need. And, and then if there's any time, we can go over resources, but if not, um, you will also have access to those. So looks like a good amount of questions, Rachel. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I will read these through to you. And uh, in any clarification, I believe that folks can unmute themselves if they need to. So I'll read the questions, but if we need a little follow-up, that should, that should work fine too. Okay, okay. so. Um, Question from Good Earth Gardens. How about rain gardens in sandy floodplain zones? 
For example, I have seen spots with a downspout where the water drains completely without any flooding. Would you recommend just letting it drain like that or install a rain garden, add more organic matter and let it hold more? Okay. I mean, I would say I always recommend, you know, what's going to be the most practical and functional. So if you already have really sandy soils and, you know, you're, you're not seeing any pooling and the water is already draining great, you probably don't need one. Um, I mean, maybe you could install one as more aesthetic, but in terms of functionality, I'd say if you're already dealing with sandy soils and um, it's probably fine. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Just kind of be up to you at that point. Okay. Um, and here's a question from Max. How much more valuable is a rain garden just downstream of your impervious service surfaces plus a rain gutter versus an equally sized rain garden placed elsewhere? For example, how much bigger does uh, a less than optimally placed garden need to be to be equally effective. Okay, that was slightly confusing for me. So Max, if you're still here and you want to unmute yourself, unless you got that, Cora, that was fine too. But when I read that one, I wasn't. Yeah, maybe yeah, we can clarify that. Here comes. Sure, Cora. yeah, sorry. I was just curious, like you mentioned your example of a rain garden, like being like all the water is flowing off of the roof and the driveway and you put it right downstream of that and captures all the water. Yeah. Uh, what if you place a rain garden like somewhere else on your property? Like it's not going to capture all the water running off. So um, it might capture stuff coming up from your neighbor's property or something. I was curious like how important placement is. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think in terms of placement, I think the, um, the go-to design is just off of rain gutters because when people have drainage issues, it's mainly around the home. But I'd say if you're more experiencing drainage problems, you know, maybe you're next to an orchard field and they have, you know, there maybe if they water, you, you're experiencing drainage from them, I'd say, yeah, plant the, the rain garden wherever you're experiencing drainage problems. So if around the home is fine and you don't want to capture your roof, um, putting it elsewhere isn't not allowed, you know, I, that, so I, I appreciate that clarification because that's, that kind of, expands the, the possibilities of, of where to put it. You know, you can really put it anywhere as long as you have that buffer, it's not too close to um, a fence line or foundation, you can really put it anywhere in your yard. So I appreciate that question, Max. I think that's good. Um, yeah, just wherever you're experiencing drainage problems, that's where you should, you should place it. Um, but it's all, you know, downhill from something is great. You know, if it's uphill, then it's just not gonna capture much, so. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> okay, Max has a lot of good questions. Okay. Um, so he says, maybe I missed it if you mentioned it, but should the various zones of the rain garden, wet, moist, and drier, be a certain proportion of the total area? Yeah, I thought that was a good question. Great, yeah, so kind of a vague answer, it depends. I mean, roughly, I'd say it's like a third for each but it really depends on the size of the rain garden and the depth of the rain garden. So if you have poorer soils and it needs to be larger and deeper, probably that wet zone is gonna be a little bit bigger because you're anticipating more standing water. But if you have really great drain soils, it's probably gonna be more a third. Um, so it really depends on the rain garden. It's not really a perfect equation every time it goes back to the different designs and the sizing based off of the needs. But if you're kind of just dealing with standard soils, I say a third moist, a third intermediate, and a third dry is like a good starting point. And then you can add or subtract from there based on how well your native soils are doing. Hmm. Okay. Um, and then Max also had a question about um, the bio prefix, bio swale versus just a swale. Is that, is there a difference? Oh, the, um, so sorry if I use that interchangeably. So the bio is just um, mainly because it's with plants. So essentially it's a bio swale if it's vegetated. I call it more swale if it's just rocky, but they're kind of interchangeable. Um, it's just one contains rock and one doesn't. They're both swales, but only the one with vegetation is a bio swale. Okay. 
Uh, all right. So then, um, then there was a question when we got into the swales and the one where you had the picture of the before and the after um, yeah. slide number 42, did that fulfill the 10 foot from the foundation rule? Yep. So I think with that one, and again, this was, um, she had some extra money from her grant. So that was one of those critiques. I, I don't think it did. I think it was a little too close. And that's what I would have changed or, you know, if, if she, if that would have been something that we were paying for, um, I probably maybe wouldn't have placed that in the side yard just because there is not enough room. If she had a wider side yard, maybe, but no, I don't think that was within 10 feet. I think it was five at the most, if not less. And the guidelines still apl applied to that, the bioswale, it was the same guideline of distance? I, ideally, it would have been that. Again, that one was more of like an aesthetic example, but um, okay. I don't think it fulfilled those requirements. So it was kind of like a good and a bad example. That's why I included it in there. To, okay. You know, don't put it too close like this All one right. did. Okay, good. Yeah. And then Max had a good point. I thought he said, um, or because it's a swale and not a garden, is it built to shuttle the way the water away from the foundation, maybe, but it's supposed to be still infiltrating, it sounds like from your description. Yeah, it still needs to be infiltrating. And the thing with bioswales, even more so with rain gardens is because it's so channelized and it's diverting water, you're, you're transporting water. And so you're really like, here, water, come this way. And so if there's any variation in slope or, you know, there's not enough vegetation or it's too close to something else, you can be like, oh, I'm going to push all this water towards the fence. I'm going to push it towards yeah. my foundation if there's just a slight change. So that's why it's nice to have that buffer. Um, and it's mainly in those large, you know, surge events. Um, and right. standard uh, rains would probably be fine, but if there's any overflow, it's more of where would the overflow go in that design because it's too close to the to the foundation and the fence. So that was more of what, what the concern was and why the buffer is needed. Okay, and another question, um, you said the slope um, uh, kind of requirement. So if the slope is greater than 5%, would terracing be a better solution? Yeah, I think, yeah, terracing would be great if you still want to plant that site, that would be great. You just probably wouldn't want to install a stormwater feature in that sense. But yeah, I definitely think terracing is great. I've seen success in that. Um, yeah, I would do that. It just wouldn't be really a stormwater feature anymore. It would still be like a, like a water-wise landscaping, but just not a rain garden or a swale. Okay, and then here's a question question sounds like it's from Trisha. Can you or Rachel comment on what native plants are typical in vernal pools? Ooh, well, you know, we actually have a vernal pool plant list on the district's website. <laughs> nice. Um, and I can even, if we have a little bit of time here, I can go on there and, and show that as part of our, you know, looking at resources, but you'll get that link, Trish. So if you're curious on the different types of plants, either to plant or just plants to look for. It's not an all-encompassing list, but we do have one. And that's gonna be more helpful than me just like, let me see if I can remember all of them. And some of them are very have. specialized and some of them are exactly. even, like in Yeah, danger I'm not the botanist so. here, Rachel is, so. <laughs> but, yeah. but that's great that you have a resource. Okay. Yeah, we do. Yeah, so if, even if there's not enough time, that link will be in the notes, Trish, so you can look at all those. Hopefully that'll be helpful for you. Well, that was the last question in okay. chat. I don't know yeah. if anyone wants to give a thumbs up. We Down in your reactions on the bottom, there's a little smiley face. And if you give a thumbs up or just unmute yourself and ask a question, feel free. Otherwise, I think you have some time here that you could, oh, here sure. we go. Okay, Marcy. So go ahead and unmute yourself, Marcy. Sorry, I just meant everything was fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. The traditional, the, yeah, I know. That was an A-OK. -okay. <laughs> no, that, that was good. Thank um, you. Well, well, what we can do is if anyone has questions, just while I'm still talking, feel free to write that in the, in the chat box, or this will be the time where I don't mind if I'm interrupted by someone's voice, just go for it. Um, but I'll just kind of um, go through some resources that I have for everyone. And yeah, that'd be great. 
help with some next steps. So I'm gonna go back into my PowerPoint as kind of a guide here. One moment here. Okay, and I will um, turn off my picture and I'll just monitor the chat for you. Great, perfect, Rachel. And if there are questions, just feel free to, um, to let me know, just interrupt. It's all good. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> okay, so our first resource, I don't know why my computer keeps freezing like this. It's a new laptop. All right, I'm going to exit out and start over. <laughs> I swear it only does this when I do presentations. Uh, of course. <laughs> come on, I, 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 no other time. It's, it's so funny. Okay, let's see. I'm going to share my screen again. Maybe if you mute your video, maybe it's a bandwidth issue. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'll try it once more, and if not, I'll, I'll do that, Rachel. Thank you. Okay. I'm stubborn. I want it to work. <laughs> oh, I want it to work. Okay, so here's the resources. So, okay, so here's our website. So this ties into Biosol Plant List Rain Garden, and there's also Vernon Pools. So, so our main website is jswcd.org. And all I did was I went to plant, so I'll kind of do a little test run. So this is our main website. If you go to find resources and then plants, we have a bunch of information about plants. And if you scroll down, here's our plant lists. And then we have a bunch of different types of plant lists. We have many more. Honestly, there's so many more I want to add. But here's just some that we have right now. Um, so we'll just open up the biosoil plant list for fun. So we have all of these pretty plants. I also noted um, based on Ashland fire recommendations to not plant within, I believe it's 30 feet of a home. Um, so that's noted if you're an Ashland resident, but so these are what our plant lists look like and I'll make sure that these are sent out as an attachment as well. But that's kind of where I was getting those plant lists from for both of the um, stormwater types. So if we want, just for fun, since we have a little bit of time. So Trish, these are the types of plants and I don't know if Rachel wants to, and I also want to make sure we can go over other resources, but these are just some plants that I found were commonly in um, Vernal Pools here. Um, hopefully it's accurate, Rachel. But, yeah, that <laughs> looks good. I'm not sure who's um, going to have those seeds in the plants for you. Um, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah those with, are um, I feel like with vernal pools, and then we also have these, um, I feel like with uh, vernal pools, it's, they're less, one of those sources that it's, it's a little difficult to, to find versus, you know, like riparian plants, standard riparian plants. Um, you know, though, um, I, I would say, I mean, now is a good time, well, probably in vernal pools also, actually, now is a good time to be collecting seeds. So if you have a friend who has vernal pools or you have a vernal pool on your property, now going out and looking at what there is, you could collect some of your own seed. It's a good time for everything. Definitely, yeah, and save some money because plants sure add up. So if you're able to be resourceful that way, I think that's a great, um, it's a great point, Rachel. Okay. So that's kind of the main thing I wanted to highlight on our website. I think we also have, oh, I also want to show you where the Oregon Rainwater Guide is um, or the Rain Garden Guide. We did not publish it, but we have it linked. So just for ease, I can show you where that is. So since it's a rain garden, we have it under plants since it's planted, but we also do have a whole other stormwater section as well. So I'm going to scroll down to Rain Gardens. And then Should if we you be scroll seeing down, your screen? Should we be yeah. seeing your screen? We just yeah. see, I still only see the website um, plant lists uh, slide, I think. Oh, do you not? Um, can, can anyone else, Rachel, can you see my screen? Yeah, it's just the plant lists. Oh. So it must be frozen again somehow. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, well, Pop we're going to stop and then we share again. Sorry, guys. Thank you for mentioning that, whoever mentioned that. I appreciate that. Um, here. Okay, can you see that on the website yes, here? that looks good. I can see it. Great. Okay. So yeah, so I went to find resources, plants, and then rain gardens. 
And so this is where that Oregon rain garden guide is. And this is a large document that has all of those steps. Um, you can order it online if you want a hard copy. We also have some limited copies at our office, but not really the best time to get hard copies right now just because we're not <laughs> that great staff right now, but um, it is out there if you want it. Um, but I just wanted to mention that because that has so many more details if you really want a step-by-step -step guide for rain garden installation. And we also have that sizing guide that I showed in terms of the percentage of the roof there. So that is that. So, I'll, oh, now I know why you couldn't see it. I think it's because I, I didn't have my source. So this is just gonna be annoying, but I think I'm gonna have to do this every time going to and from my presentation. Okay, I'm not even gonna go into full screen because we're towards the end here. Um, so the next resource I wanted to show you guys is the RVSS LID designs. If you didn't know, Rogue Valley Sewer Services, a lot of us pay our sewer bills to them, but they also do have a stormwater program. And they have some really cool local maps that shows different biosol features in rain gardens in the valley. So you can look online or you can just drive by to kind of get some um, inspiration, if you will. So I'll go onto their website. I'll actually just um, go onto their main website to show you how I got here. So let me stop my screen and then I'll go there again. Sorry for the, for the wait. <laughs> Those are really fun and inspirational. Talent is a real hot spot of yeah. impact development. Just a second. Typing, typing. Okay, so I'll share my screen again. Share screen. RVSS. Okay. So you should see that. Can you see their website, Rachel? Yes. Okay, great. So you go to rvss.us, just like if you're gonna pay your bill, and then they have their stormwater section and you could get lost in this. They have a lot of documentation. So for more like construction, commercial things, a lot more um, permits and stuff than residences have to deal with. But they have a map here, just kind of on their main stormwater page, low impact development. So if we click that, you can see various bioswales locally, and then they actually have a bunch of other stormwater types. They have a couple of rain gardens. I'm, I know that there's more, but um, oh, then they even have, you know, pervious pavements, planters. Oh, that's fun. So, that's great. because, you know, there's, there's websites where they have example pictures, but it's really nice to have local, right? Because these will have local plants and you can have a little self-guided tour. That'd be kind of a fun, activity to do. So, um, so yeah, I wanted to show you that. Um, so oh, that's terrific, Cora. Thank um, you. Let's, yeah. So let's see. You know, um, I think occasionally they out. also coordinate, do coordinate tours of those features, don't they? I have heard of, yeah, the tours. So that might be, um, they in, might have in a that future in like on where their, we... yeah, exactly, <laughs> their website. But, um, yeah, so that's, something fun to peruse and look at pretty pictures. I always love to do that. Um, looking at, you know, making the plant list, looking at the pictures is always the fun part. So, um, and this just shows you, you know, like this is a really wide swale, so they can vary greatly. So it's just mm -hmm. kind of fun see some local examples. Nothing better than, than that. And um, so you don't have to be looking at examples from like the East Coast that maybe wouldn't be as well suited for here. So that's the go out and check them check them in action when it rains. Yes. Yeah. Look when it's right. yeah. So you can be a weirdo if it's raining and you're driving. You pull over to a stormwater feature and we're like, okay, what's it doing? Do I want to install this on my property? <laughs> like I'm taking notes. <laughs> okay. So back to this. Okay. So now we're going to. Go back to the PowerPoint. Oops, there we go. Max asks again, are there any specialists in swale construction? With swale construction, you know, in terms of like actual, um, like in terms of permits with 
construction permits. Honestly, I know RVSS has done a lot of construction with that. I could help with the design, but I'm not, I don't have like a, a license in that, if, if that's what you're wondering. Um, but, and also, um, I can imagine a lot of um, landscape architects, um, depending on what their specialty is. Um, I know, I, I'm sure, you know, several places can specialize in, in stormwater with swales. We actually do have a contractor's list. And within that, there's um, stormwater. So if you're interested in that, Max, I can send that to you or um, have that, or you can email me and I can send that out and that might help if you're looking for more of a, of a specialist. But I, I don't have like five people off the top of my head, unfortunately, but they are out there. And I mean, I could help with design, but in terms of licensing, um, there, there are several local people because, you know, they're installed but, everywhere. They're in parking lots and stuff. Max, are you really in Portland though? Because we're in Jackson County and- Yeah, currently I am. We're trying to relocate down to the Southern Oregon area. Okay. Okay. Well, um, gotcha. Gary Krause, who's in our class list, um, he's, he says, I design and install them. So are you looking for help Perfect. installing them? I could connect the two of you. Um, yeah, I just would love to see yeah, a contractor. Is. Yeah, they sound great. I mean, that would be awesome. Um, yeah. Networking, amazing. Gary, you could share your email in the chat or I can, I can send it afterwards as well. Cool. All right. So just a couple more resources here or unless there is other questions we can answer. Um, oh, okay, I see. I just got the notification late there, okay. Um, so the next one is the web soil survey. So this is a nice, fun resource. I'll make this bigger so it's easier to see. Oops. I actually did this of the SORAC office. Um, <laughs> just, you know, why not? Um, so this is great. This is from a survey done by USDA, I believe back in the 80s. So you have to take that with a grain of salt with development, particularly in neighborhoods, right, with all of the amendments and compaction that happens. But this is a great website because it shows you uh, the native soil layers. And so obviously it's great to do those hand tests and infiltration tests yourself, but also it's good to know what natives you're working with throughout your property. It can show, as you can see, the, the line here, it shows two distinct soil types kind of within this area. And a huge note with drainage problems. If you're constantly experiencing drainage issues on your property and you don't have really a slope and you're watering everything the same, you might just be dealing with two distinct soil types. You know, one soil would be well-drained, maybe one's a little more poor, and so one's running into the other and underground and then it, the water's stopping and then it's starting to pool up. So the soil really tells a story and I think the soil survey is really helpful in all of uh, that. If we have time, um, I can do a little mock calculation if you wanna see it in action. But um, these are the types of features that I look at um, with honestly any client. Whenever I do a site visit for anything, I always create a soil map because it it's very helpful. So the typical profile is very helpful. There's the properties and qualities, so it'll show the natural slope. It'll show the depth to restrictive feature. Um, so this one's more than 80 inches, so that's good. It's, it's good to know if a restrictive feature is close. Um, for example, if there's a hard pan layer, it might be a little difficult in installing a rain garden or, or a swale or a biosoil. <laughs> and um, this it describes the natural drainage class. So it looks like Sorex soils are well drained. That makes sense since they do a lot of, of growing and, and ag in that area. And it also shows the depth to water the water table. So if the depth to water table was really, really close, again, wouldn't be good for a rain garden because you don't want to just hit water. So that's helpful. And um, and then it I think the other, this other Newburgh um, soils, the other properties were very similar. So I just included the slightly difference in, um, in the profile, but that's the web soil survey. Um, I think we do have a moment here to go to the website. 
So I will stop my sharing for a second. All I'm doing is Googling USDA web soil survey. That's a good idea, Cora, because it's not fully intuitive there. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go back to this. We'll share. Yeah, it's, it's not the best intuitive website because it's a little outdated. And um, so it's just better to show you what to do. So here is, oh, hi, kitty. <laughs> Oh. Um, <laughs> oh, that's funny. It was Rachel. I liked it. My cat was saying hi. So this is the, the web soil survey website. And so you go to the start button and it'll direct you to a page that looks like this. And it, it's of the entire country. So you can do it up in Portland too. So I always go by address. So if you type address, it's really not case sensitive either. So just as an example, I'll type in my office. Enter. So my office is pulled up. I'm going to plug in my mouse real quick. It's just easier with scrolling with this feature. Um, so you can see that little dot, that's our office. So zoom in a little bit. So then you wanna create your boundary. And our property boundary is about here. I always go out slightly because it's always nice to see what you're, what's happening with your neighbors. And so this AOI stands for area of interest. So I'm gonna use a triangle one since this is kind of off and it's not a perfect square. So we just kind of do this, click. And then when we're done, I'm gonna double click. And so it seemingly does nothing besides that, but it's really doing a lot. We're gonna go to the shopping cart for free. And this is the non-intuitive part that Rachel was talking about. Um, there's no payment involved, but you do go to a shopping cart. And there's different features you can check out on the website itself. I always like it to create a, a report for me just because I can print it out and have it on site. So we go to this checkout feature, which if I'm covering it, it's just behind me. There's a little checkout button and there's the get now. You say, okay. Takes a second. Oh, I have a, I have a pop-up disabled. I want to enable it. Hopefully that does something. My security settings are too strict on my laptop. Here we go. We're trying again. Okay. So now this pops up uh, another separate screen, and then this is a full soil report of the property. So in the beginning, it describes how the soil, how the data was taken. And then you have a little legend and keep scrolling down. Here's how they're made. So this shows two different soil types and the property. And again, that's why it's nice to zoom out because you can see if your neighbor has a different soil type that might describe some drainage problems. So keep scrolling down. So it shows the two distinct. And then here's the features. So it's a really nifty feature. When I go out on site visits, I normally just print out this, you know, these couple pages. And um, it's just really nice. It's a really nice feature. It's helpful. Um, again, it's never gonna be 100% accurate. The most accurate is gonna be actually digging in the soil yourself. But I think it's a really great starting point and it also helps describe um, the different soils with your neighbors too, since you might not know those soils. Um, so definitely good feature, good place to start in terms of determining your soil type. So I'll stop sharing now. Looks uh, like Max says for an urban soil survey, like your example, how accurate would it be? Would it be old data? Yeah, so that's a good, 
mention, um, yeah, so it would be the old data. Um, they haven't updated it, from my knowledge, since the 80s. And that's why I kind of noted in urban areas with fill and with amendments over the years, I'd say this survey is probably just going to be more accurate in ag lands that but even even so over the years things can change i think it's it's you're mainly going to deal with accuracy several feet down which you're going to encounter with stormwater features um, but in terms of like the first few layers just for standard gardening um, i would take that you know with a grain of salt in terms of accuracy um, that's why it doesn't replace you know the field test or an infiltration test but it can describe those natural layers and if you have any hard pan right that's not going to change in 30 years um but that's a good point that um it's, it's also kind of a can be a scale issue i know i i have yeah. a lot so it's much smaller and sometimes those boundaries aren't exact they were extrapolating out sometimes using definitely yeah features or whatever so they're a really good starting place but you always want to um kind of ground truth it totally I that it makes sense Definitely, yeah, yeah. It's and thus far, I found it to be fairly accurate. But but yeah, of course, they yeah, the boundaries might not be exact. Um, but yeah, just always good to to not take that at face value. Like, oh, that must be the soils I'm working with. Make sure to to double check that with some oil, other uh, soil sampling techniques. Well, more I, more I was thinking just exactly where the boundaries are. I think yeah. It's amazingly good information, but the stuff like urban or development issues, I, I definitely have those features at, at my sure. end. But, um, yeah. but then also just exactly where they are. It's not like it was drawn with a Totally. Label. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> and a good it might point, even Rachel. miss some things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It might be yeah, even more detailed and not just this entire chunk is one type. Yeah, it might um, simplify it a little too much sometimes. Um, but yeah, good point. Well, we're almost out of time. There was one resource, but that will be in the notes. I'll just kind of explain it real quick. It's called the Oregon Flora Project. And yes, I know I'm always telling people about this. Um, I believe it's it's mainly from BLM, but I know, um, I think OSU helps as well. It's like a collaboration. And I love it because it shows a bunch of native plants and you can specify, so in this area, you can click on the Siskiyou's tab and it specifies native plants that you can find at local nurseries. And that's a big thing, you know, you can, you can know the nurseries in your area and you can know native plants that suit well in stormwater features, for example, but it's hard to know if they're available. And, um, Again, calling around is, is always great, but I think that that also is a great starting point to kind of know where to go. So yeah, Oregon Flora is really great. I have that direct link in the notes, so you'll all get that, but um, I love that website. So Yeah, it's, a, it's <laughs> another, the, like the soil survey, it's a whole rabbit hole that you can go Totally, get. yeah, and you can get lost under there. There's yeah. so many other tabs. I'm mainly just in the gardening tab, but yeah, it's a really <laughs> great resource. So yeah, you can get lost on there, set a timer maybe, but... <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I think it's, yeah, it's 730, but I really appreciate yeah. everyone's time. I think this was great. Um, I really appreciate everyone's questions too, that, you know, really helps with the whole, uh, it's not just me hearing my voice for 90 minutes. <laughs> it's a strange um, world. And well, thank thanks you so much, Cora. Um, yeah. That was yeah, really that useful. I learned a couple things myself. Um, oh, great. Great. So thank you all for joining us and I will, it will take Zoom a, a little bit to generate the video and then I will have to work my way through putting it up for you guys, but I will send you an email if not uh, this evening, then tomorrow that will have the resources and the PDF and a link to the recording of this uh, class as well. So thanks so much, Cora. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks everyone. Have a good weekend. All right, take care. I'm gonna end the meeting for all of us. Okay. Bye, guys. Okay.